So I was just going to say um, that this is going to be streamed live on Facebook. And so if you don't want your name or video in there to turn off your video and change your name. You got it. I'm going to do, I'm going to turn off my video right now, just so that I okay. see you. <laughs> so if you need anything. Beautiful. I'm going to just share my screen. Give a shout. Okay. All right. Check the winner one more time. See if we have anybody. Waiting to see if it does not look like it. Since we are three minutes in, I will go ahead and just get started. So I would like to thank everybody for joining us. Uh, hello, welcome. Uh, thank you for joining myself and A2 Therapy Works as we present our newest installment of our free virtual parent training series. My name is Annie Warburton. I am a speech language pathologist here at A2 Therapy Works. Um, if you have any questions throughout this presentation, feel free. If you're joining us via Zoom, go ahead and write them in the chat. If you are watching via Facebook Live, go ahead and write them in the comments. I have somebody that's monitoring those and will alert me so that hopefully we can answer these questions as we move throughout here. Today we'll be discussing myths and facts related to speech and language development. So I have got some yes or no questions that we're going to answer that are just common questions related to that speech and language development. Um, I'm going to give you some answers to those as well as just some information to sort of back up those answers. So um, if you are feeling curious and just kind of want to know sort of more about development and feel like you've heard lots of different things and um, all these different ideas kind of that uh, don't always mesh together, um, then hopefully we'll be able to put some of these pieces together for you and all make sense using both evidence and um, just clinical expertise, things that we've uh, picked up just from working with these kiddos and then with lots and lots of research backed up as well. This presentation was originally created by Samantha Hagen, so thank you to her. And it was modified by myself and our clinical director slash speech language pathologist, Caitlin. All right, so myths regarding speech and language development are fairly common, unfortunately. These can arise for a variety of reasons. Um, the internet can definitely be one of them. While there are lots and lots of really great reliable resources out there, there's also some that are not so reliable. And if you're looking in the wrong place, you can find a lot of really misleading information, unfortunately. Um, so having websites that we know to trust and to not trust is super, super helpful. Um, I've got a list at the very end of our presentation today of some websites, some books, just some things to give you a little bit more information if you're looking for it, um, that you can kind of dive in yourself and get some either deeper answers to some of these questions or just kind of explore um, what development looks like and how that might differ between children and ways to promote that speech and language development as well. So the internet, like I said, can be a super good resource and we've got um, examples of that, but also not everything out there is gonna be uh, a great information that's based on that, that fact or science. So um, there's also that oral tradition. So receiving parents advice, grandparents advice, aunts, uncles, some of those people might be really great resources. Others are just passing along information that they found either useful or think might be useful to you, um, which sometimes again can be a great resource, other times not so much. Um, and then on top of that, we also have some of our doctors and pediatricians. Hey, Annie, I'm going to pause yes. you for a second. Hi. Hi, guys, this is Caitlin interrupting. You just, every once in a while, you sound like a robot again. And I'm not sure yes. if it's your headphones or if it's the connection or what, but I just wanted to let you know. Can't hear you. Can't hear you at all. Technology is wonderful. Turn off my blue. There we go. I can hear you. Yeah. Okay, okay. good. Mm -hmm. Yay. Thank you for bringing that up to me. I appreciate that. I'm sure it'll mm -hmm. be a lot more helpful to cool. be able to hear. Yeah, that's what we, I was thinking too. I think that would be able to hear <laughs> Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, I appreciate you. Awesome, well, thank you for Caitlin for that. Hopefully you guys can hear me now throughout. I'm sure she'll pop in again if we have any issues. Um, so then the last one I was gonna touch on is just doctors and pediatricians. So these are great people to trust with 
physical illnesses, just general advice. Um, however, not specifically trained on speech and language development. So some pediatricians may know more than others um, and may just provide kind of a general overview and give answers that are a little bit too simplistic. So it might either alarm you a little bit too early or um, have kind of the opposite effect. So we just wanna make sure we're giving everyone really sound advice and sound um, information so that you can make the decisions yourself um, with the help of us if you need us. So um, those are just some of the ways that we can have some of these things come up. And our goal at HA Therapy Works is to stop spreading those myths. Like I said, we wanna give you that information so you can make those decisions and really just have you know the best information possible. So that is our goal today. And to jump right into it, to start with our myth or our question number one, did I cause my child's speech and language disorder? The answer is no. Um, a lot of our speech and language disorders, um, they can come from a variety of reasons. So genetics can be a big part of it. Um, brain development or injury, so something like a stroke happening early on, um, a TBI, anything like that. Um, underlying developmental disorder, so autism, Down syndrome, um, things like that can also be a factor. And then just variations in personality, learning styles, um, temperament. Every kid is gonna be a little bit different, so we cannot say exactly when they're going to meet every single milestone. I think um, if you speak with a speech language pathologist, they're kind of always gonna say, you know, these are the norms. Obviously we have kiddos that lie within here and um, kiddos that lie outside of it. So um, just knowing that every kiddo is different and there's gonna be different reasons why each of them has some of these disorders and sometimes the cause is just unknown. So if we aren't exactly able to pinpoint an exact moment or um, an exact gene or um, another underlying disorder, then sometimes it's just kind of, we're a little bit in the dark in terms of that. But the great thing about speech and language development is even if we don't know the cause, we have got lots and lots of research to help us promote speech and language development. So kind of get on the other side of it. While we don't know what caused it, hopefully we're able to um, provide the resources and the support in order to um, just get that development back to um, yeah, where we want it to be. We can get, keep them moving in the right direction. So the next thing I wanna talk about is just ways to promote that language development. So um, like I said, even if we don't know the exact cause, we have some really great research-based ways um, to really promote that development in kiddos. Number one being reading. That is a huge thing for kiddos. Um, reading, playing games, those are all really, really important and give lots of opportunities um, for just learning new vocabulary, learning new grammar, all sorts of things. It can be super helpful. Singing songs, getting some of that like rhythm, the prosody of our language, um, along with being able to listen and hear some of those um, cues while we're singing some nursery rhymes. So. Um, they're not only getting that like expressive, they're able to verbally output some of these things, but they're listening so they know what's coming next, what kinds of sounds, like if we're thinking of like old McDonald, um, being able to think, okay, this is a cow, what does the sound that a cow makes and really pushing those together. So um, hopefully making those connections a little bit more. Modeling language, so speaking a lot with your child, around your child, um, using some uh, pretend play is always super fun. And that can go right along with our reading and singing songs. So we can sort of make some uh, pretend play activities regarding, you know, being at the farm or um, playing like princesses in a castle, all kinds of things like that. So um, we really encourage that pretend play as well. Play is huge for um, encouraging that speech and language development using some self-talk, so some sort of like self-narrating what we're doing. So while we're playing, if you have, um, you know, your toy and you're going, oh, he is walking. Oh, I am moving him over to the farm. And now he's, and just kind of talking about what you're doing. So it's just giving more and more of that input. So rather than just kind of showing them, oh, this is how I play with it, you can narrate it as well and give them those words to go along with it. And then presenting language in visual and kinesthetic forms as well. So action words are great for this. Things like jump and run um, are always throw, are always um, super helpful just to give sort of those visual representations as well. So just pairing, you know, not only the word with the action and then just getting a little bit more excitement in there and um, yeah, getting them moving if possible. So um, creating opportunities for language use. So um, communication temptations 
this is really just to hopefully promote them to use the language. We don't want to force them to use the language, um, which is kind of my next uh, bullet there. And we just want to give them the opportunity that, oh, I want that. Let me see if I can get the words to be able to obtain that, um, but without kind of forcing them to do that um, and upsetting them in that way. And then using everyday tasks to model language. So these are things, you know, while we're going about our day, talking about the things that we have to do. So again, kind of that self-talk, um, but also just, you know, as you're talking to your neighbors or, I mean, people on Zoom, <laughs> that's kind of what it is these days. Um, just giving opportunities for them to hear that language, to learn different contexts when we're using it. Sometimes um, code switching. So if you're using another language, when do we use that other language? Um, they're just able to kind of pick up on sort of those nuances. So just lots and lots of um, models for them. It's really, really important. Lots of play, lots of fun. And our next question is, does exposing my child to a second language early on delay speech and language development? The answer to this is no. I think this is kind of a fairly common misconception. Um, really the best time for us to introduce any language is before the age of five. We have just got so many things going and um, working in our favor in those age ranges just because they've got so many things developing and they've, they're just little sponges. So. We really wanna try and push that as much as we can when they're around that age, um, just because they're so much more likely to pick up on that a little bit easier. Um, there's sound and prosodic be benefits to it as well. So if a kiddo is shown a language um, when they're really still developing, they can start to develop some of those sounds that might not be in another language. They start to develop some of the different um, prosody, so kind of the intonation or the sing-song of our voice as we are um, speaking our languages, those differ. So being able to pick up on those little things and really um, giving them the opportunity to speak that language um, really fluently, that's really important to do uh, early on. Along with just picking up on some vocabulary, sometimes what we might see, which doesn't indicate a disorder or a delay of any kind, some kiddos that are dual language learners, multi-language learners, um, they might have a little bit more of a limited vocabulary just around the age of like one to two, just because they are getting more input. They've got vocab in one language and another language. So sometimes it takes them a little bit of time to catch up to that, but that's as long as there's not a disorder there, um, that's definitely something that they'll, they'll be able to do. And then, um, yeah, learning another language will not cause or worsen speech or language problems. Bilingual children develop language skills just as other children do. So that is warranted if we do not have a speech and language disorder. And that's really when, um, you know, we start to see those concerns come up that, uh, you know, oh, should I have not been teaching them this? Or, um, yeah, that's, they think that that was what it was that did it. And we can certainly say that that is not what caused it. And then going on from that, just to give a little bit more information. So tips for promoting that language development in a bilingual home. Um, we encourage speak the language that you are most comfortable speaking. I can't tell you, I don't, I never want people to not be speaking their own native language because they think, oh, I need uh, this, you know, I need my child to speak this, this language because that's what they're going to be learning in school or anything like that. Speak what you're most comfortable speaking. They're going to learn language better from, um, you speaking one that you can give more complex grammatical structures, um, more vocabulary, all of those things can be a lot more helpful than just speaking another language that you're not as comfortable with. And, you know, obviously there's lots of cultural implications to that as well, not letting them um, speak their, their native language or um, something like that out, out of fear of delaying them. We do not want that misconception out there. Please speak with your child in the language that you are most comfortable with and, um, and give them that opportunity to learn that as well and be a part of that. And then from there, when it comes to using both languages in the home, fantastic. We always suggest using one language per activity. That way you can focus on the structures of that language, um, the grammar, like I said, and then some of that like vocab in that language, then moving on to another one, you can use another language to describe some of the same things. So hopefully we're still making those connections and pairing and as we're you know, switching language between activities and doing things differently every time, we are always increasing those. So 
Um, that's just to really kind of keep it straight between activities, but hopefully we're still getting kind of some of that commingling where they're understanding that, oh, this means the same as this, and I can use both of these languages, which is great. Um, uh, there are uh, fantastic resources out there that have books in two languages, two or more languages, really. Um, you can find these on languagelizard.com or on Amazon. And really, they're just bilingual books that have, you know, one line says it in one language, the next line right below it says it in another language so that you have the opportunity to read the book twice and talk about, you know, oh, well, we're going to use this language as we discuss the book and then being able to switch and, um, yeah, give new explanations and vocabulary in different languages is, is a super great opportunity. And there's so many like classics that you can find too. So if you were looking for a specific favorite book that you want to have in a, um, a bi bilingual um, format, then that could be somewhere to look as well as just that language lizard or Amazon. And then singing songs. So as we said before, just promoting our um, language development through singing songs, reading books, all of those great things, pretend play, um, sing it twice. So giving them that opportunity to again, hear it once in one language, again in the next, listen to how those differences in the language um, start to like transform the song or um, there's like small changes or little nuances, all of those types of things. And then just creating a nurturing language environment at home, which is basically all those things that we had noted in the ways to promote language development, making it fun, making it active. Um, yeah, just supporting them in those ways and giving them all those opportunities. All right, myth or question number three, is it bad to teach my child a second language if they are already delayed in the first? Answer here is also no. So this is still the best time to expose your children to a new language. Even if they seem like they're struggling with um, either their native language or um, their first language, it's still better to let them have those benefits when they have got all those things going for them in their brain. So they've got all of those sort of mechanisms that are already firing a little bit faster than they will be once they get a little bit older. And um, if there is a true disorder in, in the language, then you are going to see it in both of those languages anyways. So really, again, it's better to start now. That way they're kind of overcoming some of those small humps um, and hopefully can get some help as well from a speech language pathologist. And then, yeah, using the same techniques, promoting both languages in the home, just like we kind of talked about. So again, just going over a lot of things we already discussed is really just promoting that language in the home and using both of those um, as you feel comfortable. All right, myth or question number four, can my child learn language from just watching TV or playing on a tablet? The answer here is no. Um, language is an extremely interactive process, so we really need that one-on-one uh, -on -one, uh, group setting, being able to be social with others, um, and picking up on those nuances uh, that happen, you know, within those peer-to-peer -peer interactions. Um, the best way to encourage language development is through that, of course, and children learn best through play. That is a really big thing that research has pointed us to for quite some time is that um, play is going to lead to more diverse uh, vocabulary, more language structures, things like that, that we just wouldn't get from only watching. Um, not only does, you know, when you're looking at a screen, you're not getting that interaction of, you know, people reacting and, um, and that kind of thing, but you're also not uh, stimulating a lot of that verbal output. Um, even if there is like those question answer type things, not every kid is gonna respond to those. They might not even know how to respond to those um, if they're not familiar with that kind of um, question answer type of thing, or um, yeah, just aren't really sure what the answer or the question is. And when we have that, you know, peer to peer interaction, it's not just the screen going, great. You are actually able to help them out, give them the words, give them those, uh, those little pieces that they're kind of still reaching for. So um, we always suggest that peer-to-peer -peer and person-to-person -person interaction is best. Um, there are some new studies out that tell us that large amounts of screen time is associated with lower skills in the areas of like problem solving, just really like cognitive executive function type things. Um, I think that that can be 
very hard sometimes to limit that, especially for some of our kiddos that do have disorders, um, parents that are really busy, um, single parents, really anyone that's got that's got a lot to handle right now, especially with everything being online and, and all of that, it makes it, you know, that's kind of a, a great tool to be able to, you know, keep them busy and um, be able to get some stuff done yourself. So I totally get that it is definitely um, a feat to limit that. And they say about two hours a day, uh, coupled with good night's sleep and sufficient physical activity can definitely result in um, better cognitive function. So with that all said, there are some resources out there to help anybody that is looking to lower any of that screen time. Um, and screenfreeparenting.com, I think is a good one. They have, I think she wrote a book. Um, they've just got activities to try to, um, as like replacement things. And again, it might not be possible for everyone. I know circumstances are a little weird still. So um, don't, feel bad if you are not able to do that right now. I just wanted to kind of put those pieces together because what the research is telling us and then what's actually possible are two totally different things. So um, don't get down on yourself if that is not something that's gonna be possible for you right now. So there's great ways to use technology to promote speech and language development, thankfully. Um, so it can be a great, great tool if it's used correctly. So. I did want to just note really quick here that AAC devices and programs are not included in that um, two hours a day. Their devices should be with them all the time um, if they're high tech or low tech. Um, I just wanted to kind of clarify that that is not what I, not what I meant when I'm referring to that. Um, you can do sing-alongs online. I do that with some of my kids where we're, um, you know, talking about, oh, the different language and maybe I'll have their AAC device I'm modeling for them while we're doing our sing-alongs um, or they're, you know, singing along with me. Uh, interactive games you can play together. Again, you get that uh, like fun interaction where you're asking questions, answering questions, um, kind of getting into some of like the emotions of all of those things that all kind of need to be discussed and um, and talked about in order for us to be, you know, functioning in the real world. Once kids go to school and, you know, if they lose a game, we can kind of talk about, oh man, it's kind of hard, right? So it gives you those opportunities um, that you might not have, especially living in Michigan don't always want to go outside to play some of those games that are a little bit more interactive and fun. So um, that's just some options there. Um, so again, feedback and questions during those games as well. Um, using technology as a reward for some kiddos um, might be helpful to get some tasks done during the day, especially like speech and language related things. Um, being able to complete activities and then going, all right, so now we, you know, it's a reward. You get to use this for however long you guys decide and then, um, yeah, using it in that way and then watching a movie or a show and then acting out during a play. So kind of like I talked about with some of our books, uh, you just have the opportunity to have some more stories be told and um, retell them. And uh, yeah, you get to use that technology where it's sort of like, oh, okay, we got to do that, but now let's bring it back to the real world and we can um, really start to hone some of those language and speech skills as well. All right, on to our next myth. So will using other means of communication, pictures, signs, et cetera, um, stop my child from learning verbal language? This is a no. And I do see where people kind of can believe this. And I think this is kind of one thing that um, a lot of parents who aren't familiar with AAC or augmentative and alternative communication, um, that they, that might be a big fear of theirs for sure. And that is totally warranted, but, we do have research that tells us that that is not the case. Um, a lot of cases or a lot of um, our research studies have actually showed um, an increase in verbal output. Sometimes those are modest, so it's not always a huge change. Um, but as long as you know, we were focusing on these areas simultaneously, we're giving them um, the opportunity to communicate, but we're not um, taking away their voice. So it's not as if you know somebody tries to say something and then we go, no, 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 let's use our device. We want to make sure that we're supporting both of those areas. So um, again, just working on those simultaneously will be super helpful. And then what we hope is that if they don't have as much frustration, which can happen if they don't have any way to communicate, they don't have pictures, they don't have words, um, anything like that. If we don't have a lot of that frustration, then hopefully then we'll be seeing a little bit more of, um, yeah, that kind of calm communication where they're able to get some of those words out versus being flustered and upset to the point that, you know, we're having um, a meltdown. 
and speech oh, oh sorry about that <laughs> jump back up there ah sorry i actually went to the wrong place okay here i am again okay so there's also a lot of research to say that um aac supports receptive language development emergent literacy development all really important things i know for parents and you know for these kids moving on through life going through academics and just social situations and all sorts of things. Um, there's a lot of effects for pragmatics, so that social communication, um, the vocabulary in our language, the structure of our language, all of those things are being increased by using those um, AAC type devices and then using some of those model based interventions. So being able to show them how do we use this, um, what words make sense here, and um, yeah, giving them all those models and opportunities for that. And whether it be high tech, low tech, so sometimes we use PACs, which is picture, uh, picture exchange communication systems, or there can be speech generated devices or SGD. And um, there is no research to say that for either of those. We see um, inhibited speech production, oh, but in the case of in these, we start to see a little bit more. Again, sort of modest, but at least we're seeing more and not less, which is good. And then just to kind of harp on those again, the benefits of our AAC, I think it's so important to have this for kiddos that aren't able to get that verbal output. Um, it reduces that frustration, gives them um, an ability to effectively communicate before their verbal words appear, excuse me, encourages opportunities for more verbal models if they're able to communicate and um, go up to a peer and actually indicate that they want to play versus just going up and you know, grabbing something or, or what have you, um, having those words and um, ability to kind of go and make friends, they also get more peer models. They also get um, more of those opportunities for those exchanges, kind of that turn-taking piece of it as well. So that social interaction, being able to use language without being stressed and, you know, if they're not able to get the words out, then they have a picture that they can show you. They can get their message across and that is huge for some kiddos and, and very important for anyone. Everyone has the right to communicate. So um, giving them that is, is very important. Okay, moving on to myth number six. My child has been struggling for years. Is it too late to start speech therapy? The answer here is no. Um, while early intervention is important and something we definitely harp on, um, getting help now is better than waiting. If you're not sure, if you've been waiting, cause you're like, maybe he'll, you know, you've heard from the doctor, he'll grow out of it, one of those myths. Um, then it's really great to do a little bit of research and try to find out, okay, where are they at? What kinds of skills do they have? Where am I seeing concerns? And sort of comparing that with some of the data that we have out there. So I had just noted here, more inter information on identifying the signs of communication disorders. This is an initiative by the American Speech Language Hearing Association. So they've got lots and lots of really great evidence data-based information for you to sort of know when that help is needed. Um, and if you're not sure, call us. We are happy, more than happy to do that. Um, I do a lot of the intake and I hear from parents all the time going, just not sure. I'm kind of concerned. I want to cover the bases, but I don't really know if it's necessary. And a lot of times we can kind of get to the bottom of that, sort of hear what their concern concerns are and maybe look over a little bit of the literature together and then make that decision of, okay, let's bring them in for the eval just to make sure. Let's, you know, I'm hearing some, some things that are sort of flags. Um, so we are also here to be a resource as well. Our myth or question number seven, does the use of flashcards in programs such as My Baby Can Read help with language and literacy development? No, unfortunately, um, it is not just something that we can have on flashcards and they'll just learn all the words and then be able to put them together and that will be, and then they'll be done. We have to have um, some language learning through interaction. Like I said, that's just what the research tells us is play. Um, those things are so important for kiddos learning that and just showing flashcards is really not gonna get us very far, unfortunately. With that said, there are great ways that we can use flashcards in order to promote that. So instead of just using drill, which is a great, still an, an okay thing if we're just learning, you know, 
initially learning a skill, um, we can isolate it, practice it, excellent. Where that kind of goes off is when we're not able to generalize any of those skills. So being able to use them in different situations in different contexts. So by doing those things with play, it's super helpful to kind of give you that um, a real world piece of it and sort of be able to play with it that way, like, like an actual play. Um, and then flashcards can be useful, like I said. So you can use them when we're first starting a skill or we can really use them like while we're playing, we can play hide and seek with our cards. We can uh, put them in like a touch and feel box. So we put them in a box reach in, look at it and go, ooh, what does this feel like? Uh, what's the name of this? Color, talk about all the different things. Um, what noise might it make? What If we listen to it, what noise might be here? Um, all, all sorts of things like that. So they can still be very useful. I'm not telling you throw out your, your flashcards. I just wanna make sure that we're also um, encouraging those interactions as well. Um, my baby can read, I know, I don't even think it's called that anymore because they had so many false claims that, oh, this will teach them what they need to know um, when really we know that that play is what's gonna get them hopefully where they need to go. All right, oh, and I also wanted to mention in terms of our literacy development, uh, you can help your child develop literacy skills during regular activities without adding any extra time to your day. Um, so these are things you can do during play, like planned play and reading times that you've already got set aside with your kiddos. Um, show your child that reading and writing is a part of everyday life and can be fun and enjoyable. Um, so it, it doesn't necessarily have to be something where you're sitting down and drilling them. It can be, you know, everyday things that will hopefully um, encourage them to take an interest in that and start to pay attention to some of those things. And um, I actually did a presentation on emergence, emergent literacy a couple months ago uh, through our parent training series. So feel free to look at that if you need any further info there. All right, our myth or question number eight, uh, can I start teaching my child how to read if he or she has a speech or language delay? So the answer here is yes, most definitely. Um, Em oh, excuse me. Emergent literacy instruction should begin early in preschool period. Um, and this is especially important for individuals with speech and language disorder. So some of our kiddos that have these disorders are going to be more likely to have issues with literacy later on. So really giving them the, that instruction and um, helping them to understand those things early can really make the difference in how they do later on. Um, Reading also promotes an exploration of the child's interests. And so hopefully from there, we can sort of see um, a development of new vocabulary. I know some of my kiddos that are, they love dinosaurs. I can't tell you how many like multi-syllabic words that they can just spit out like that because they're so interested in it and they love talking about it. So they've got practice all the time. So um, you can really start to get at some of those skills by finding out what their interests are and then sort of, yeah, diving into those and doing some reading and all of those types of things. And then our very last myth today that we're going to debunk is if my child is coming to therapy at least once a week, do I need to do work at home too? Most definitely. <laughs> so the answer to this is yes. Uh, once or twice a week is not gonna be enough practice. Um, we encourage repetition, generalization of these skills is kind of hard if we're only doing it online uh, or in the therapy room 30 minutes, 40 minutes, once or twice a week. It's going to be really hard for them to take the skills that they learn with us and then put them again into those real life situations. Um, obviously, we do our best to promote some generalization within our therapy setting, um, but without, you know, transferring those skills into their home life and everyday life, um, it's gonna be really hard to see the progress that we're hoping for. So providing that feedback as they're speaking with you, um, making sure that we're thinking about some of these skills as we are in different environments um, and then repetition. So a lot of things that I usually like to tell people, especially for like um, our speech sound disorders, kiddos that are working on those speech sounds, finding a couple minutes, five minutes a day where you're able to, do an activity with them, think about those speech sounds, talk about those speech sounds, um, just doing things in a way that, um, again, isn't adding too much onto your plate, but is encouraging the use of those skills, reinforcing the uses of those skills, and then generalizing those skills. And I know, again, home practice, COVID, 
it's all difficult. I totally, totally get it. I know life is just weird and it's hard to get all of those things. You know, every single thing on the list is important. So um, I know sometimes it, it seems like that's sort of on the back burner. They already go to speech. They have that support. We want to make sure that we're giving them as much as possible. So I did put a link here as well. Again, going through ASHA, or the American Speech Language Hearing Association, an excellent, excellent resource, always reliable. Um, and this is home practice guidance for our parents during COVID-19. So just some ideas of things you can do, um, you know, at home, ways you can promote some of this info. And um, yeah, hopefully that will be super helpful for you. And then if we go on to the next one, we basically just have some reliable resources for you guys to have. Um, and I'm happy to share these. I'll be writing a blog post related to this. So um, if that might work to just share it there, that could be useful as well, or feel free to screenshot, jot it down, whatever you would like to do. Um, we start at number one with the CDC, where they've got some milestones. So information on, again, knowing where should my child be? Do we need help? Um, really taking the next step to understand um, if you're going to need some more support. Identifying the signs, again, something that I had noted um, on that previous slide, just talking, giving tips, all sorts of great, great things, which is super helpful. Um, E2 Therapy Works, we have a blog and a vlog, which is fantastic. We are always trying to put together presentations like this and information that will be useful for you guys. And again, it's always research-based, clinical expertise-based um, things that you can rely on. And then ASHA, American Speech Language Hearing Association, uh, just going there, finding their speech account. So it gives you a little bit more on development, um, learning two languages, giving you tips there. And then going down to our next slide. We have, again, that speech development, building on some of those skills, so tips, activities to be able to use, um, which is great. Just having more and more in your toolbox is always helpful. Our ASHA account in Spanish as well, for those who need that. And then um, just more and more activities. So I love it. We've got lots of really great, so like some of them are um, hindered to our kiddos that are multilingual learners, sometimes our preschoolers, just speech and language development in general, sometimes working with um, our toddlers and, and babies and things like that. And then I've got one more as well. And these are, um, these are books. So talking on the go, beyond baby talk, it takes two to talk. Some of them can be, I know it takes two to talk is a little bit more expensive, um, but it's marketed toward children's with language delays. And it's definitely a book that can be really helpful for um, a lot of parents that are just feeling like they need a little bit more support. Um, and then at the very bottom, we have a calendar. Just 2020 gives a little bit of information, um, hopefully that you guys will find useful. It's for children 18 to five years. So um, it's still a great resource to be able to look over and just have um, there for yourself very end of my presentation is just my references. So using, again, we love ASHA, <laughs> using all of those resources as we have them. Um, and I will go ahead and double check that we don't have any questions because I, I think I've gone over everything that I had for you guys. And hopefully this has been really um, just some kind of basic knowledge and really we didn't dive too deep into any of these things. So feel free to use these resources that I had noted. Um, to be able to look further into those or use us. I'm more than happy to answer any questions. Um, I believe our next, yes, our next slide is just giving you um, our contact info. That way, if you have anything else, you have any like questions that you'd like to ask one-on-one, -on -one, I am more than happy to answer those for you and just sort of discuss, um, yeah, sort of some of those clinical pieces that maybe you just wanna have a little more information on and have a better understanding of, so. We are always here for you, whether you decide um, to refer or, um, yeah, however we can support you, we are happy to do it. So I will go ahead and look in my chat just to make sure we are good. No questions from Facebook either, Annie, so we are good to go. All right. Well, thank you everyone that was able to join. We appreciate you and good luck. Let us know if you need anything. <laughs> Take care, you guys.